welcome to Pharma Television News Review here at the 4th Midkine Symposium in Budapest in April 2016. On this show, I have Professor Richard Barker, um, who is the uh, founding director of the Center of Advancement of Sustainable Medical Innovation in the UK. Welcome. Fintan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. You've got an amazing background. Um, besides being a, bo a board member of several biotech companies, your background has been uh, involved in uh, the pharmaceutical industry and, and various, in, um, various, various associations of the uh, pharmaceutical industry. But more importantly, you're um, currently um, chairman of the position Medicines Cat uh, Catapult, uh, but also you're involved in a number of other um, organizations that specifically look at this issue of translational research. And I, with somebody with your background, obviously, uh, you, we, we, we all like innovation, and Bitcoin is an, in, an area of innovation. We've got to get that innovation and move it forward and to ultimately get to patients with their, their cures and so forth. What is the challenge for translational research? Well, you're right. Translation is definitely my passion. Uh, what I do is contrast what happens in some other areas to what's happening in life sciences. So if you think about information technology, for example, we're in, a, in an area of exponential or an era of exponential growth in the application of technologies in practical ways that you and I understand and experience every day on our iPhones or smartphones. Right? Yeah. Um, if you look at life sciences, it's interesting. There's a similar exponential increase in basic understanding of bioscience. I mean, the numbers of papers, the numbers of symposia and conferences. So we appear to be making really rapid progress. But when you look at what actually is happening to products and patients, it's rather disappointing in my view. A lot of potential, but not so much delivery. And so let me give you some numbers. Um, there are about two million papers published every year in PubMed or collected together in PubMed. Of those two million, some people would estimate maybe a quarter are both reproducible and relevant to uh, improving uh, mankind's lot. Um, of that, you get about 15,000 patents that are in drug-related areas. Uh, from that, you get about 5,000 products in the pipeline. And when you get look at what goes through the FDA or the European Medicines Agency, it's only about 40 or 50 products. Now, we're very pleased about those products, yeah. and some of them are quite transformational. Yeah. But in fact, the fall-off rate from basic research down to the products and patient benefit is actually rather disappointing. Right. So that's the issue. So how do we improve that? So I, I believe that precision medicine is at the heart of this. I think what we have to do is, um, or I think around seven different things. I mean, the first really is to really understand the implications of our discoveries for the mechanisms of disease. We're in the process of redefining disease. We're also in the process of understanding the system in which molecular pathways sit. So we have to, I think, drive much more research into the very specific molecular basis of disease. The second thing we need to do, I think, is improve the, uh, the interface between uh, academic research and industry. Right. These have been rather separate worlds. And it's nice at this meeting, we're seeing them two, the two worlds coming together. But too often, academics want these things, industry people want those things. They maybe mistrust or misunderstand each other. So the collaboration between academic and industry is going to be, I think, the most important area. Um, another area is obviously collaboration across companies. Right. Some companies um, have very complementary skills, and there's certain things like biomarkers for particular diseases. We need to see more collaboration um, across industry for that. Yeah. The third area really is um, this tremendous fall off rate between the number of products that go into the clinic and the number of products that come out of the pipeline. We've been working, I've been working on the processes of adaptive development. So instead of taking so long and costing so much money before any patients get the opportunity to benefit in a routine basis, can we, by targeting medicines more uh, carefully, using these molecular markers that I'm talking about, uh, enable patients to receive them earlier with uh, conditions? The conditions are we collect the data on the routine care that we subsequently provide to ensure that we are either refining or confirming uh, the, the positioning of those products. Right. I, I suppose then, in, in, in the end, there are several, what you're, if I can summarize what you're saying, 
is that you know, science itself will improve our ability to do that. Our, our basic knowledge, our scientific knowledge will help to accelerate this process. But it also requires changes in the way we organize ourselves, how industry operates, as you say, with academia and so forth. But I suppose the other one, which, which uh, is also for discussion, is the regulatory environment. Because obviously, you know, clearly the, um, the FDA and the EMEA will want to protect patients and we all endorse that. But the approach that we take to, to, to the regulatory environment and the alterations to that, at the same time keeping patients safe, we can change the way in which drugs can be quicker to be discovered and quicker to get into patients. No, you're quite right. I mean, we've had too rigid a set of regulatory systems across the world, actually, for too long. Now, I wouldn't criticize the regulators um, for not being a little bit flexible because we're putting, we have fast track yeah. or conditional approval sure. and so on. But they're thought of really as exceptions to a rather rigid framework. I think we need to move to this more adaptive approach. What do we know about the disease? What do we know about the needs of patients? How urgent is that need? Um, and how can we in fact design the development process and the timing of conditional approval of the drug? Uh, to, to match what we know and what, what the needs, the driving needs are. I mean, for example, in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, where boys typically die in their teens uh, and, um, and mothers and fathers are actually desperate for treatments, we're having great difficulty getting anything effective into the treatment of that disease because we expect it to actually answer the questions that other more common diseases have posed um, whereas, in fact, if every patient is different, the course of their disease is different. Uh, and there's a, if there's a strong hypothesis something should work, we ought to be able to design the development process, the regulatory process, to meet that need. Right. You, you, I know you're, in, you're writing a book, and I think that book looks at gaps in translation. And how would you define those gaps? Where are those gaps? So I, I've, I've um, identified about five, five gaps in translation. Um, and so the first one of these is what are we working on? What are we asking our academics to work on? Now it's remarkable that in this explosion of bio, biological literature we have relatively few people focused on disease mechanism. Now they're interested in basic biology and that's of course the important yeah. foundation stone, but not enough work really uh, on, on, on disease mechanism. The second gap is the gap from we're doing work but are we translating it into clinical candidate products? Um, and that's about some of this academic industry collaboration that we're talking about. We need better incentives and better collaboration mechanisms for that second gap. The third gap is the gap between the number of things in the pipeline and the number of things that get regulatory approval and get reimbursement approval. And that's about this redesign of the process, this more adaptive approach. There's an interesting fourth gap, which is in the area of adoption and adherence. So even many of the medicines that get approved um, actually are not widely adopted for years in the medical community and then actually not adhered to or complied with by patients. We need a more engineered approach, in my view, to implementation of, of, of innovation. The final thing, gap is the gap between what we might be able to discover about the use of products uh, uh, from routine care and what we actually are learning. So we have the ability now with electronic medical records and machine learning and other approaches to be able to deduce from the everyday practice of medicine a lot of really important insights as long as we collect reasonably good quality data across a wide range of patients. So to me there are five gaps to work on. Right. Um, sufficient number of gaps I would say. Um, I, I suppose it, it just finally on this, I mean obviously you know over time, things have improved, there's no doubt, and there are these gaps still remaining. How, how do you see the future going forward now? Because obviously the filling of those gaps are going to be important. But what sort of shift do we see occurring now in medicine? Because there are these um, hotspot areas like immuno-oncology and so forth, which are partly answering some of the questions you're raising there, Start partly filling in the gaps. There are some changes with pharma companies working closer with VCs, pharma companies reaching better into the universities, universities reaching better into, into the uh, pharma companies. So I think it's a process, I suppose. So how would you see the gap-filling process going forward? So I'm an optimist, right? And so I call the book Bioscience Lost in Translation, 
how precision medicine is closing the innovation gap. So I, I see a lot of encouragement in, in the way that you're, uh, you're talking about. And so there's some many very exciting uh, therapies in the pipeline now for cancer. You mentioned immunotherapy. Uh, we're beginning to get a handle on many inherited diseases and potential treatments for those. But we still have the need to focus them and get them through the pipeline more rapidly. And so um, these wonderful new CAR T cells for cancer um, it's, there's still some, some significant translational issues that we, we, we will confront and we'll need to make sure that the patients who will benefit from the most are the ones who receive it. Otherwise, the people who pay for health care won't pay for those. Richard Barker, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. No.